Hello guys, what's up? I'll go by the name is Coast Prince and if you are new to my channel, welcome. So apparently, man, this is not a reaction video. This is just basically my intro to the video. So apparently yesterday I was part of the um, the live video of M.I. and King Kaka. They actually did a live video where they discussed on a very delicate topic, a topic that which is actually relatable to everyone because this is what we are facing in our society, not just confined to a location like Nigeria or Africa, this is what people are facing all over the world. So they talk on gender-based violence. Um, I'm not going to say too much because the video in itself is very lengthy. So I will just um, lead you guys to the video. So King Kaka and Mi um, did the the interview, the live um, discussion, the live session together, um, talking about gender-based violence. They invited some speakers to come and shed more light on the issue. So guys, um, without further ado, you guys should watch this. I may mean, not be so accurate on this, but um, what eventually happened is that there's been a lot of pressure, there's been a lot of, but it's normally, and this is also very important, right? It's not only when there's a case that men should speak up. It's not only when there's when, when chaos has happened. Sometimes we need to speak up when there's a, a group of women going to the House of Reps or the House of Assembly, so to go meet senators to, to, to get legislation. Sometimes we need to, to speak up in a room when uh, women are talking about being treated fairly in a workplace. You know, yeah, I yeah. remember one time at my, at my office, we got called out because this is maybe five years ago. The ladies in the place were like, look, every time that, that uh, somebody comes in and you need water or something needs to be cleaned or something they'll say oh yeah uh, uh biola or whoever is there you go do it right and at the end of the day when you look at it like these things can happen when the culture and the systems of culture allow it to happen right when it's only men that are holding other men accountable and there's no legislation in place if you go to a police station as a woman who knows if the policeman that's there isn't also beating his wife and isn't also going to be sympathetic to the man that comes through the door and be like, hey, you know how these women are, right? So one of the ways to do it is be able to, 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 to in addition with all the things you mentioned, is, is be able to, to support where it matters, make sure that we have societies that, are, that have um, legislation, that have laws around these issues, make sure that also that women know where to go and what resources they can access when when they need of help and, and something like that. And then always speak up. Always speak up to your guys. This is not okay. This is not right. You know, always um, always uh, speak up when you see it happen. I was driving to I was driving to my office the other day, just a short story. And um, okay. and uh, my head was down on my phone. But one of my partners was in the car, her name is Debbie, and she saw a guy come out of the car trying to open the door. So she told us this guy's beating his girlfriend. We stopped, we came down. The guy got on the bike and left. We brought her out, she had bruises all over her head. You know, we took her to our, our restaurant and we just brought lawyers and then everything sort of took place. But I, I remember going back home that day and just telling Debbie, I said, thank you, you know, because she as a woman, she saw it and felt something was happening and for her it wasn't even a conversation, I need to stop. And I was saying to myself, I wonder how many other cars had passed and people had looked and been like, well, that's not my, my issue. But yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a that. woman is well. getting beat by the side of the road, you know. It's crazy. I think yes. uh, I think we, we can invite... Uh, is, is IODG here? If you're here, please wave. Yeah, 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 we should. Let me let me introduce, I don't know if you know her so, so well, but uh, she's just amazing. Um, let me see if she's. What's the handle? Yeah, let me let me look and see if she's in the handle. But ladies and gentlemen, we have um, an amazing young woman. She's 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 done amazing, amazing. She started. I don't I actually can't see her. I actually can't see her. Good. Because the request here that I'm getting is from uh, Sadia Sadia. I can see her, yeah. Mm. So let, let, let me let's maybe ask Fifa or someone that's on the on the Hive team if they're paying attention. Um, I know that they'll be watching the live. Can one of you help us find out where uh, uh, IDG is? 
and, uh, and uh, before she gets, um, I think I, I don't know. You know when 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 we have such conversations. What also bothers me is that, like people would say, ah, man, those are boring conversations. Yes, she is. Or she's oh, so what's that? Yeah. So she just wrote yes. So she's amazing. She founded an organization called Stand to End Rape. She she uh, needs she needs to send a request though. Yeah. Hold on. Let me see if I can. Okay. So that's yeah, right. All right, Edgy, can you send a can you send a request? But yeah, please. everybody, please, when we're done, please check out Start to End Rape. They're an amazing organization, and uh, she's in the front line. Man, anytime there's issues of gender-based violence or you know, things like that, she is, you know, she's out there working, you know, standing in the gap for young ladies. She's amazing. Yeah, yeah, people are saying she's on. She just you send. Let me check. Uh, technology, technology. <laughs> oh yeah, I've seen her. Boom. I think that's the right. That's the right account. I'm just, I'm just, I just sent the request. Yay! Hey. hey. Sorry, I was saying hi. I'm here. I sent request like three times, but it wasn't getting to you. Sorry. Hi everyone. Hi, how are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you good doing? Good to see you, by the way. Sammy, I haven't we seen you since 2015. That's crazy. That's crazy. We, but we spoke a lot last year. We spoke yeah. quite a bit last year. Yes, we did. Yeah, we did. We did. Hi, King Kaka. Nice to meet you. Same here. So maybe I maybe we should start by you just telling us what you do and telling us about it. Yeah. Start. Okay, sure. Um, my name is Oluwashio Ayodeji Oshobi. I work for an organization called Stand to End Rape. We just said hi in the comment section. Um, it's a youth organization working around policy advocacy, creating awareness, engaging boys and community members on how to prevent sexual and gender abuse violence but importantly, also providing holistic support to those who have experienced any form of sexual and gender based violence in Nigeria. So that's a brief of what we do. We do a lot of work, but yeah, that's the overview. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're just catching up on and sort of think, listening to each other about what, what, from our perspective, our lens, the context is in Kenya and Nigeria. But with the work yeah. that you do, you're in the front line. Like, share with us a little bit about your context and what you see and how bad the problem is. Okay, so sometimes when we talk about um, sexual and gender based violence, people don't actually know what it means. So I'll just explain it really quickly. So it's any harmful act that is carried out or directed at an individual or a group of people based on the agenda. And it basically, um, you know, borders on. Um, patriarchy, inequalities, um, cultural norms that do not respect the rights of one gender. And like you know, in, in the African context, unfortunately, um, women's contributions and even lives are not valued as much as men. You know, it seems to be a man's world. But now girls are running the world. Um, but yeah, that's really what sexual and gender based violence is. And if you look at the global data, it's really a bad issue, like a big issue we're dealing with. So I only threw a few data. Um, so it affects one in three women globally. Um, Thirty-five percent of women worldwide have experienced either physical or sexual violence in their lifetime. Imagine the number of people in the world, women. Thirty-five percent, yes, of women worldwide, right? So globally, seventy percent of those women have been sexually assaulted by someone older than their partner. So this could be a neighbor, a colleague, a lecturer, whatever it is, other than their partner. And in Nigeria, there's a data from UNICEF that says that one in four girls and one in 10 boys would have experienced sexual violence before the age of 18. So if you know the, the scope of, or, or the population of Nigeria, about 200 million, so now think about, say, women or girls make up a quarter 
one quarter of that population of 200 million, and one in four girls will experience rape before age of eight, the age of 18. That's a huge number we're dealing with. And just to create more you know, understanding of what GBV is, because people think GBV is just rape. No, there are different forms of GBV that happens across Africa. So the first is female infanticide. People don't know about this, but there are cultures where if a woman is pregnant and they see that uh, it's a baby girl, they kill the baby because they have a preference for the male child. Reason being, you know, carrying the name of the family uh, for the purpose of acquiring properties and things like that. They don't think girls are as valuable as, you know, boys, so they kill girls at, at, at a very young age. And another thing is first and um, child marriage. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. Um, young girls getting married off before the age of 18 under the, the guise of culture, religion. Um, we have honor claims and crimes. Well, that is not really popular in Nigeria. It's popular in other countries where a perpetrator's motivation to commit crime is because he's trying to protect their culture. So, for instance, if I am of a certain religion and I am seen doing a TikTok video where a part of my body is showing, it's seen as sexual impropriety. So, the perpetrator feels the mandate to protect his culture and religion by killing um, the woman. Um, we have dowry related violence. This is like the funniest violence ever. Like it's not funny in practice, but just thinking about it doesn't make sense. So as for cultures where women pay the bride price, if the family of the woman does not pay adequate bride price to the man, the man will kill the woman because he's not satisfied with the bride price. That's a that's like a culture. Yeah. It's really crazy for real? have to deal with. Yeah, for real. And there's female genital mutilation, we I'm, I'm sure we all know that where girls are caught at a very young age, um, because you know there are different narratives that they will become promiscuous, or if they give birth and the head of the baby touches their, their private part, the baby will die. Very archaic thinking that doesn't have any scientific backing. Then of course we have the 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 you know the widely known domestic violence, and that's like a different brand of um, GBV. Inside that violence, you have physical, you have mental, you have um, financial. Uh, there's so many variations to domestic violence. There's sexual harassment, academic institutions, workplace, you know, there's just so much that women, you know, tend to imagine all of these violence are counted and one person can experience everything in their lifetime. That's how much of an issue we're dealing with. And if you look at 2020 during the pandemic, we recorded a lot of cases in Nigeria that um, we asked the governor's forum, the Nigerian governor's forum to declare a state of emergency on GBV in Nigeria. So we're dealing with, like, I, I know COVID is a pandemic. This is like a, an epidemic and a pandemic joined together. Um, and yeah, women are just not safe in society. That's too, that's, that's, that's too much to take in. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just, it just has to be said. So people understand no, that no, when no, women like are it. shouting and fighting on, on Twitter or anywhere, it's not out of anger. I mean, anger is good, but it's because these issues are way too much for us to bear, really. I think the thing that does my head in the most is when you think about one in four yeah. And, yeah. and the implication of that, what it means is that even if, let's say that, the average sexual of offender is a multiple perpetrator, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not doing the math all the way, but it would mean that at least one in 10 men in some form would commit some act of sexual or gender-based violence, right? Yes. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm, yes. Being, I'm being so... So I think it's this veil of silence where where society wants to like not really look at this issue or talk about it or you know and we just pretend as if rapists are all living in or, or like white beaters or or people that are, violent, are all living in the bush somewhere and they're all crazy people when actually it's everyday fathers brothers you know um it's 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 really crazy do you have any data that you can share with us if any data i mean it's not you don't have to but um about the, the demographics around the perpetrators and like how close they are to family members and stuff like that. So I don't have the data here, but based on the cases that you know we've seen over time, the perpetrators are actually closer to home than we think. And they fall within the bracket of father, brother, uncle, and teacher. 
um, and which is for you know domestic violence and rape to be specific. But when you look at issues around sexual harassment, you know that's empl- employer, colleague, lecturer. You know that's that the demographic of perpetrators. And you're actually right. Um, you know these people are closer to home. It's not just one stranger. I mean, I gave you data. On, you know, women globally. Only seven percent of women globally who have been raped um, uh, were raped by someone other than their partner. Which means more women are raped by their partner and relatives than strangers. I mean, rape by strangers does occur, but it's more about people who live within um, our environment or who we see every day or who we trust. Because rape has to do with you know trust and power, right? These are people you will trust or um, are in sort of a position of power where you feel that they will not abuse that position to violate you. But unfortunately, um, they, they leverage on that trust and power and violate. It's crazy. Um, uh, my wife has a, has a YouTube show um, called Parenthood. And they did, a, they did a story where she shared a story. And uh, she just told guys, if, if you have any stories, let's encourage each other and just share yours. The level of and the amount of stories that we received on just people talking about relatives and cousins and brothers touching them inappropriately and raping them at a tender age was too much. Guess what? Like, just do not put this anywhere. But I was raped by my brother. I was raped by my cousin. I was raped by my uncle. I was raped by my and. And, and these are women who are now broken in the society and they are grown. Their attitude towards so many things have, have now shifted. It, basically, we are damaging the future without even knowing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's right. Yeah. I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know what can be done. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I, I, um, can you can you talk to us a little bit about like? Okay. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask a little bit about your work. I know you work with young men, and also, but but maybe with the context about what stigma, the role stigma plays in in also perpetuating the, these cultures, you know? Because I know that when 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 these cases happen, and and they've happened, you know, around me. There's one uh, someone that was dating. I know it's fine, but um, so so maybe maybe starting with the context of of, of the work you're doing and, and 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 how that creates impact, and then also talking a little bit about that stigma piece. I think that you know I want to hear okay. an insight from. Great. Okay. Um. So for our work, we do a lot of community engagement because we are really keen on prevention, right? So we work with boys in the secondary schools and boys who are out of school, so boys and girls. We have something called the Content Education Program that we're currently running, where we teach boys about positive masculinity, interpersonal relationship, um, gender equality, sexual and gender-based violence, just helping to build their knowledge, to change their attitudes and improve the practices that we have. Because it may be difficult to change a 35-year-old man, right? That would take a lot of work. But children are like a, a, a plain slate you're working with. is whatever you pour in there that they sort of grow up with. So we're catching them very young um, to educate them, as well as girls, you know, teaching girls to be assertive. There are certain narratives um, that also perpetuate violence amongst girls, you know, and we're trying to dis- reconstruct those kind of conversations. Um, we do a lot of work around policy as well. I'm very glad, and I, that you mentioned policy. I think the bill you're trying to refer to is the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act of 2015. And just a bit of context, that piece of law took 12 years for us to get it passed. That's how much women's rights are not being valued. It was first a bill for women, but men felt so threatened, we had to change the name to violence against persons so that it's more you know, inclusive, which I actually like in, in all honesty. So what we're currently doing is, because of the federal system that we have, um, states can decide to pass the law and what to adopt it. So we're currently working with you know, state governments to adopt those laws in their states and build the capacities of state actors and non-state actors being um, police, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Health, civil society organizations to implement that law. Um, 
And I think finally, you just want to take much time. We do lots of work providing direct support to survivors because that's one thing that is important to me, how we're able to get someone who's, who feels that the world you know, is against them, the rape was their fault, they can't talk about it, you know, how they can come to stay and we're able to provide them with medical, legal, mental health, financial support at no cost to them. All of our services are free. Um, and so that's just like an overview of the work that we do. But in terms of the role stigma, please, we, are, we should understand that we have a culture of purity in, in Africa where, you know, girls' virginity is tied to our value. So when a girl is raped, for instance, she's not encouraged to speak up because it's going to bring shame to the family, like, oh my God, you know, got a virgin, or, you know, you, you are not a damaged good, you know, just very stupid narratives like that. And what that does is it empowers and emboldens those perpetrators because when survivors cannot you know, come forward, you can't really hold perpetrators accountable. When families blame the victims and the survivors, what they are doing is telling the, you know, the rapist or the abuser that, you know, we see you, what you've done is great, it wasn't your fault that it happened, it's the fault of the victim. So that's one of the things that, you know, the culture of uh, um, stigmatization and silence you know, uh, does. I just want to acknowledge someone in the comments who said, um, who's commented and said that uh, she's one of the people that has been molested. I can see the start to end rape social media team my hair. Um, uh, thank you for leaving a comment. I won't call your name, but um, maybe you can just reach out to the start to end rape team and you know maybe have a conversation from there because this is really it's really heartbreaking and really, and really yeah, it's crazy. crazy. I'm also seeing I, I'm also seeing a lot of stats. Like one in three Kenyan females has experienced an episode of sexual violence before attaining 18. One in three. Yeah. Whoa, it's too much. I think we also need to add, um, we had another guest. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe just before we add, uh, are you adding the person right now? I don't know when when you're ready. Let's do that. Yeah, I, I just maybe I just wanted to ask uh, a question. I mean, this is always very important. Um, um, a lot of people that are going to be on the live are going to be young. They're going to be um, maybe not empowered within the context of society. If they are to be in a family where gender-based violence is happening, or they're experiencing it themselves. Are there resources like immediately that we can share here about uh, about how we can um, how, how people can figure figure out what to do there in that situation right now? I mean, absolutely. You can reach out to Stand to End Rape on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or you can find a sexual assault referral center in your state or in your country. For those who are not from Nigeria, um, to receive support. And if it's something you see in your family. Please speak up, encourage, you know, the survivor, you know, there's one thing for you to experience rape. There's another thing for you to be doubted and shamed by those who you think should help you. So don't be that person, you know, um, take action. And I, I just want to drop this real quick for those who are watching. We need to unlearn, learn, and relearn. Everyone does, you know, every woman knows a, a victim, but no man seems to know um, an abuser. It means that we're not holding ourselves accountable enough. It means we ourselves as men, this is me talking as a man now, <laughs> we ourselves as men, you know, are perpetrating the violence and we're not holding, and we can't hold ourselves accountable. So you can only hold someone accountable if you yourself are not perpetrating the violence. So please learn about consent. You can go on our website, um, you can go on our Twitter page, you see every information you need to know about what constitutes you know, sexual violence or domestic violence and what to do and what not to do. But in, 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 in my final remark, I would say that, you know, we can end living our lifetime and it takes a collective action. So if you're in a state or in a country where there's a policy not being implemented, are you engaging your lawmakers to implement it? Are you holding your governor accountable to implement it? For organization working in this field, are you supporting them? You know, when you hear about, you know, a rape case or there's like a, what's, what's this um, thing called, like a locker room conversation when, when boys talk, do you stand up and say, nah, God, this is wrong. Now you can't be saying this. But you say, hmm, okay, okay, no. Okay, okay, you may not agree with it, but you're not changing the narrative right there, right there. You're not helping another person unlearn that terrible narrative. 
So I think that's how you know each and every one of us can take you know accountability for for ending GBV and spread the information. This conversation is great. You can also start it. Go to schools, go to churches, communities, mosques. Do anything you can to ensure that we're actively talking about this issue, supporting survivors and eliminating GBV in Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for for, for sharing. Um, I mean, as soon as you came on, like yeah. if you just look at the comments, like the the, the conversation changed, and and I, I especially want to just I, it can't be easy work. I can't imagine that you know that um, that the things that you see that you hear every day in what you do, you know, is easy. And um, I can see somebody else asking for advice. Um, the handle is there. It was Shami is doing a great job. Um, please reach out. I also saw the Better for Kenya. Kenya for better yeah. uh, handle there. So better, better, better for Kenya. Kenya. Better, for, better Kenya. for Kenya. Sorry, my bad. My bad. They're my also bad. very good. Uh, they're also very hands on on just uh, giving data and spaces and resources. Um, they've been um, helping a lot in just uh, facilitating a lot of uh, influences who are championing for solution with different problems in the country. And, and, and GPVs is one of them. And, and thank you, Better for Kenya, for setting this up as well. Akina Janet, I see you. Akina Josephine, thank you very much. Um, I feel like uh, like we, we whatever you're talking about is, it, it's a copy paste of what happens in Kenya. Since, since now we have a common problem, I think, I think we should be in unison and just have a common goal and, and a common... How, how do we come up with, with a copy-paste solution-based uh, kind of a, a follow-up? The follow-up for me is the issue because um, we, we, when, when we put up such stories and people start telling their stories, for me, I look at it as people are broken and how how do we do a follow up and just create spaces and i'm, I'm a solution based guy and and that eats me up all the time all the time like i feel like we should just live in peace and love and harmony as human beings but also we have animals within us among us <laughs> and and, and solution, solution. The resources, the stats will shock us today, and people will go back to to their to their activities tomorrow. Yeah. How 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 do we? I feel like a door to door, every weekly thing. I do not know. I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah. Hey, Kinkaka, you wanna add in, uh, Doctor Alajide? I think that yeah, is on yeah, them. If, if, if you're here, please raise your hand. So I think okay. his, his, the handle is the at UNFPA Kenya. Oh, okay. okay. Let me search. Yeah, I think we can be, there's going to be four of us on the call, right? It takes four people, right? All right. Found it. Yeah, we got it. We have, but, but, but great work, great work that you're doing. Um, on behalf of, of, of the people you're reaching and just lives you're changing, be blessed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello. Hey. How are you? Welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Good evening, wait, sir. How is everything? Very good. I've been listening to you. Quite an interesting conversation. Yes. And I do think we are actually moving in the right direction. And we have to now begin to do a few things differently. Actually think differently. And I do know you have a few questions or things you want to ask. But I will take off on the very last question that was asked. And where there was the assumption that young people, when they say it, may not be empowered. As long as everybody's got a mouth, you're empowered. You just have to speak up. You have to make it obvious and you have to make it a trend that it is not something acceptable for you. 
you're not comfortable with it and it shouldn't happen so whether it's your friend it's your family it's in your environment we have to make it unfashionable for people to violate other people's rights and that's the starting point yeah i, I mean thank you thank you so much for for uh, that comment came from me and and you're correct yeah, yeah. i mean sometimes we we, we, we look at ourselves and we absorb responsibility, we absorb our own agency, you know, but um, you're correct in saying like, look, it is the responsibility, like, people will speak up if somebody cheated them or stole something from them or whatever. Straight right? away. Yes, so yeah, straight away. Why, why should there be any difference if you see something that is grievous and is happening in your family? I think, I think silence, silence is, a, is, is killing, silence is killing progress. And that's a problem really within it in the sense that we are beginning to breed societies where it is probably not so acceptable but permissible. Mm. And so how do young men grow up mm. resorting to violence to address any grievance they may have? Mm. How do we as a society groom young men or and women to grow up to the point where whenever there's a disagreement, violence becomes an option. Mm -hmm. And that's a question we need to ask ourselves. Yes, duty bearers have a responsibility, government, the law enforcement agencies, the judiciary, and that's what we do as UNSBA, trying to work with government, the judiciary, and all of the duty bearers to play their role from, to address all of those things you've talked about. What we want to do now is move beyond that to the community because we are all products of our society. And if this society has created the conditions that makes it permissible, then the society has to begin to fix it. Where's the role of the men? Where's the role of the boys? But what also is the role of the women? Because they also groom these kids, these boys. True. Sometimes the men is absent. So what kind of values are we imbibing? where these kind of things happen and the neighbors keep quiet because it's not my business. It's actually a domestic. That's why I actually resent the word domestic violence. It is not domestic violence. It's a crime, mm. a grievous one for that matter. Mm. And so if you look at COVID and all of the things that earlier colleagues have said, let's take the 1195 line, which is a helpline that we support the State Department of Gender here in Kenya to run to respond to people who want to call in anonymously to get help. Please, January, um, you, can, you, can repeat, you can repeat the number so that we just pin it here. Well, I, fortunate, unfortunately for you, I don't know how to manipulate this so much. So if you begin to manipulate this, you're going to run into trouble. <laughs> no, she just wants to say the number. Just the oh, number. yeah, so the number. So the, point, so the point is, in March of 20, let me just be clear. In March, February of 2020, there were 86 calls. By June of 2020, there were 785 calls. Now, what was the difference? People were locked in their homes during the COVID national response. And that for me is an issue. The home is supposed to be the safest place for any individual, whether you're a man, you're a woman, you're a boy, you're a girl. And so if you're locked in your homes and people cannot move around, you're supposed to be actually safer. And so that brought out the fact that people were more unsafe within their own homes. So yes, government has a role. But guess what? What kind of homes are we breeding? What kind of societies are we breeding that the moment people get locked in their homes, then their lives become at risk? So for us, it's important that we begin to also work with community-based organizations and work with community members to start setting a new narrative. It's unacceptable, there's a problem, and we need to begin to groom people to understand that it shouldn't be the way. And then people ask, oh, well, I lost my temper. Okay, we're men, we're, we're talking right now. I've always, there's this joke, if a mosquito perches on your testicles, you'll find a more peaceful way of resolving that problem than resorting to violence. <laughs> so it therefore means that not everything can be solved by violence. We know when we cannot use violence. But when a mosquito perches on your arm, you won't do that to your testicles. So we can control ourselves. 
We have the so, power of agency, and we have to make that happen. Yeah. I think I like that analogy because it highlights, I think, some of the framework we build. Sometimes we can see the problem. Like, when the mosquito is in your private area, you know, you know that it, to do harm to it is to do harm for yourself. Yeah. And that, exactly. isn't, that isn't really as a parent. When, when, people, when people are harming someone else, sometimes they don't see the, 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 the impact back. And I think that that's where, as a society, when we start to speak up, it becomes the norm in society that this is unacceptable behavior. And that yeah. to, to, to step out of line and act in this way would actually uh, uh, um, put you in tr trouble with the society around you. And that you there will be punishment, and there will be, you know, um, uh, repercussions for that action. And then when we have societies that where that is clear, then the analogy will truly fit because then you will know that to do this to someone else is to do it to myself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just, ask just a question. That's what I was sir. saying. Yeah, like right, initially, okay. yeah, just what I was saying initially, because when when it's when it's close when it's closer to you. It will affect you differently. But then, if it does not affect you, you won't take action. That's it. Yeah, which, is, which is very sad. It means uh, we, are, we are breeding selfish, a selfish generation and a selfish percentage of people in the society. Question is, we need, we need the same people we call family and we call them love. Why are we fighting? Why? Why? And, and then that's the answer. And that's the thing that COVID has taught us. Until the last person is safe, no one is safe. It was an equal opportunity infection, meaning that whether you were rich, you were poor, you were urban, you were rural, you would get infected. But then those who bore the burden of the response were now the people that were most vulnerable. And unfortunately, they bore the burden of the response within their homes. So a young lady talked about the shadow pandemic. I don't think it's shadow. It's actually mainstream because it's about the people. So we need to begin to create the system of collective responsibility where everybody actually looks out for the well-being of the others. And those are the kind of things we want to do. While we support government systems, government policy, law enforcement, we need also to work with society to take responsibility. Africa runs by the spirit of Ubuntu, which is you are, I am because you are. We can't lose that. That's the fundamental brick that underpins our society. Yeah. Let me ask a question, sir. For, for people in your generation, your colleagues, your, 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 your level, the level that you're, you're at, I mean, are people having these conversations? Are people too set in their ways? Because at the end of the day, that's where the leaders of industry, the presidents, the the the, the cap, you know, like are people having these conversations? Are they open to them? Um, and uh, because it's great to see someone like you speaking so knowledgeably about it, but generally, the the, the picture I have, and maybe it's a wrong picture, is that the elder generation are largely like. You know, there's a way things were the African way, and it's because we're trying to move from there. Well, you see, there are two things. Everybody also belongs to kind of societies, organizations, and systems. Yes. I work for the United Nations, and so there are certain responsibilities that I must also push, and there are certain standards I must hold myself to, not only my official duties, but also my private life. And that has begun to also. And so while people may talk about African things, there are certain things that are not no longer acceptable. Mm. And so irrespective of generation, what we have to do is create a system that makes it unacceptable. Do I believe in every piece? Probably not. But do I respect it? Definitely I do. So that's what we need to begin to see. Remember, when I was growing up, you could smoke everywhere. On a plane, on a bus, everywhere. There were people smoking in the planes. Well, we True. Who has died? Nobody. And so it's just for us to begin to change the narrative and make it unacceptable. You say, go away. So when somebody says, oh, I'm dead set in my ways, it's our culture. Hey, no. So that's just the way it works. Think, yeah, I think that's an excuse because uh, so many things that are, that, were, that, were, that, were, that were being done 
in, in the early years, like 70s, 80s. They have shifted. Things have changed. And technology yeah. now more aware. And even the mindset, because how I look at things is, I mean, I have kids. This is how I was raised. So the values that I will instill in them now will, will also shift the next line that kids will think. And how do we solve problems? So I'm, I'm, I know there is hope. It's, we need to start now. And we need more foot soldiers on the ground and online and everywhere. Because the, the stats are not looking good. They're not getting any better. And we need more advocates. And when I say advocates, I mean it's not a women issue. No, it's a we issue. It's a we issue. Yeah. And so those of you who are in showbiz, who've got significant followership, have a responsibility to model the kind of behavior other people can aspire to. It's about raising the bar for a generation. Because people will replicate what they see. People would ask, you just need to raise the bar and say, guess what? It is not acceptable. And that's what we need to do. You've got the power of social media, so there's no hiding place. True. And that is it. And then we need to begin to deploy technology to provide for people who are survivors. Of and that's all we need to begin to do and do it very quickly. One more person undergoing gender-based violence or sexual and gender-based violence is totally unacceptable. It shouldn't happen. Thank you very much. I think I think that that sums it all up. You know, you really. I mean, it was so. It was so. Uh, that was very illuminating. Thank you so much for sharing with us and and for the great work that. I think Emma has a network issue. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, this All was right. very constructive. So I think I, I, I will I will finish this up and just put it up on my page for those who are in a session. I think we should normalize on just having these discussions to refresh Definitely. our minds. If we can do it monthly and just, I don't know, uh, we think we'll, we'll talk about it internally. Uh, thanks to everyone who made this possible. Better for Kenya. Is and can I make one more request? And I know yes. you know about that very well. Uh -huh. particularly as we talk about gender-based violence we also now begin to talk about mental hygiene management oh yeah i know you <laughs> yeah. so please let's do that yeah because uh hey. <laughs> when, you, when you go that direction now we will go there we'll, we'll get another session for that yeah, we'll get i another know. session and just talk about that but to everyone who attended and everyone who, who who's, who's also giving comments here we're not ignoring you. Uh, we are reading mostly everything, and we have people also following up on the conversations, just to see how we can improve the situation. Thank you. Let me read just a few names here. Uh, Marcel is saying, "Let's make it better." Uh, Janet Mbogo is here. Thank you to um, so much, Kaka and my uh, panelist. Um, uh, DJ is back. Thank you. Catherine has been very active thank you Omi one uh, is asking when am i is dropping an album uh, so so i i know there's some gems that have been dropped here uh and when i was just talking to 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 uh participants and and guys who are, who are putting the comments here how we also do a follow-up because this is not a 30 minute issue or a 40 minute or one hour issue uh we have we have a lot to talk about so I will put this up on my page and also talk to just partners and see how we can make this better. Sorry, am I, the network is terrible. Am I just apologize? And it was amazing. Thank you everyone and thank you, thank you, thank you. And remember, let's be our brothers and our sisters keeper. This is not a women issue. It's not a women issue. It's a we issue. Be the foot soldier, 